No, this, this is really a pleasure to be back here in, uh, in Wellington. Uh, I've already run into one, two, three uh, the people I've worked with here uh, over the years. I, I guess it first started, I first started coming to New Zealand when uh, it was within a year after the Commerce Act was passed. There was the first antitrust case involving the energy industry. Petrocorp was bringing a lawsuit against New Zealand refining company. Frank Handing back there was involved uh, in this, uh, Alan Galbraith, Melanie Tolomash. Uh, and uh, people here were just not very used to economics of antitrust or of competition. And so I got involved in that case. I never did go to trial. It, it settled uh, quickly. And then later there was a hostile takeover attempt by Natural Gas Corporation of New Zealand uh, trying to buy Enerco and I put together the analysis and we went to the uh, Commerce Commission and blocked that hostile takeover. So ever since I've been working on it, one of my last cases was involving BAPI, Bay of, Bay of Plenty Electricity, uh, involving whether whether control of the meters was an antitrust issue in the, in the electricity market. And, so I was the one who believed it was not and so testified. Anyway, so it's nice to get back here. I've probably been here, if I do the calculation, three times a year for 25 years. It's about at least 75 times, so I feel very comfortable. <laughs> and I actually can spell New Zealand, I think. Um, and I can abbreviate it, NZ. <laughs> what I'd like to do today is talk about the demand side of energy markets. Uh, a lot of this work I've done here is on the supply side of energy markets. Uh, uh, if you go down the streets of uh, Wellington, you see these little black brass um, things having to do with the natural gas distribution system. I had a little something to do with those, those being there too uh, in the Capuni case. So, uh, but I want to focus on the demand side of, of the markets right now. And uh, I will talk about energy efficiency. And what I think of energy efficiency is uh, economically beneficial reductions in the use of energy. Now, I want to differentiate it from turning off the lights and freezing. You know, the, the, the freezing in the dark theory. I don't call that energy efficiency. That's just freezing in the dark. I want to think about uh, economically efficient reductions in energy use. And why might you want to do that? Well, in the U.S., uh, and a lot of other countries are like, like this, focus on what I call the energy, um, energy policy triangle when you consider policy issues in energy. It's, it's uh, three things, the economy, the environment, and security. Now, I don't know that you're as worried about energy as security as we have been in the United States, but, but once at the time of the 1973-1974 oil crisis, it was a shot across the bow. There was long gasoline lines, people were fights in lines, a few people got killed because they, they cut into the queue uh, and gasoline lines. But there was a real sense that we're no longer energy secure in the United States and we've got to do something about it. So security, environment, and economy were the key issues. When you think about energy efficiency, well, the environment, um, the cleanest energy is the energy you don't need at all. Security, the most secure energy is the energy that you don't need at all. And the cheapest energy is the energy you don't need at all, too. But more profoundly than that, I'd like to show, at least for the United States, that energy efficiency has been fundamental 
to at least the environment and security. And I will also argue for the economy. And uh, I will not say the same for New Zealand. But I also believe that it could be the same for New Zealand if, if you made those, those set of choices. So if you first start for thinking about it, there really are barriers to why the invisible hand remains invisible in the energy area. Why, why uh, we don't just automatically get all the private sector actors to use exactly the right amount of energy that's most economically attractive so that the, the duality between, energy, between economic efficiency and, and uh, competitive markets breaks down. Um, there's, and there's research and development spillovers. Split incentive problems are uh, landlord in a building uh, may have different interests than the tenant in the building and uh, if anybody's renting a home uh, uh, they may not have incentives to to make longer term investments in the things that they can do but there's institutional barriers in the US you see a totally fragmented structure of the construction business from the from the architects to the engineers to the uh, construction companies to those operating it. and the fragmented system leads to a, another market behavior and then there's some behavioral issues that I'll talk a little bit more more about uh, Becky knows about these quite quite well um, low salience of energy use most of you when you think of the energy use in your home you realize it's hundreds of decisions, very poor information, adding to only a few percent of your disposable income, and you've got better things to think about. And so, so we find in the U.S. what we call the energy efficiency gap, a lot of people not taking actions which look like it's objectively in their interest. Um, we also have that issue in corporations where where often you've, in the past we've had a group of distorted incentives where, where energy use is an overhead item and not a measured item for most corporations. And what we know is what you don't measure, you don't manage. And so that's also led to um, increased use of energy relative to what is optimal. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is if you fix these gains, you could have, if, these pro if you fix these problems, you can have energy efficiency gains. That is, you can have economic benefits as well as reducing the use of energy with, with the environmental benefits and make those all compatible. Well, these barriers existed for a very long time. And U.S., United States, up until 1973, totally was ignoring energy. Um, if you work for Exxon Corporation, you weren't ignoring it. Here, if you work for Todd, you wouldn't ignore it. But most of the people in the United States weren't paying attention until um, the energy shock and crisis. If you look back, this is, I have imported crude oil prices. Uh, in 1973, it went, it, it went from if we put in $2,015 from $20 a barrel to $60 a barrel, and it was equivalent of $20 a barrel, actually it was $3 a barrel, but when you adjust for inflation, it's 20. It's been there for a long time and nobody cared. Um, that jump and the associated embargo uh, against um, several countries that has supported Israel in the war in the Middle East. Uh, sound familiar? Wars in the Middle East, energy problems. Uh, that, that was in 1973. And we continued with the uh, uh, Iranian Revolution, the hostages uh, taken, and the mullahs taking control and reducing the supply of oil went up to equivalent to $100 a barrel. So if we had this time period from 73 to 1985, 
where we had very high energy prices, and that triggered everything in the United States. That triggered the concern. Because we had a period of low prices, period of high prices, period of low prices. That was the first time where we started becoming to realize that it wasn't just high or low prices, it's very unstable prices, very unpredictable prices. So what happened? Well, first, we started developing um, a set of regulations. There were prices that were moving forward. Corporations started taking energy use into account in their innovation. That wasn't the only criteria. It was now one of many instead of none of many. And so we started getting innovations towards energy efficiency. So let me just illustrate a few things, and you see these in New Zealand here as well. The ongoing lighting revolution, we first came with the compact fluorescent lights. Um, equivalent of a 60 watt uh, light, we could use thir get 13 watts. They now sell for $2. Um, we had a lot in our house, but the only reason they stayed in the house was my wife was too short to reach them to take them out because they were just not very good quality light, but they were cheaper, but they, there was an issue of a, a, adopting them. Um, next came LEDs, light emitting dials, really good quality light, um, 11 watts of electricity that's a that gives you as much light as a 60 watt incandescent bulb. These now are beautiful lights. You can buy them for eight dollars. Uh, do the arithmetic and the price I pay for electricity. Uh, replacing an incandescent with an LED pays for itself in a year and a half. And these will these will go 50,000 hours. And if you calculate how much. Uh, if you recognize there's 8,640 hours in a year, 50,000 hours of burning electricity, they'll last a long time. Um, when I was a parent, I still am a parent, but they're pretty big now, uh, I used to yell at my kids to turn off the lights. Now you don't have to do those, and most buildings have, have switches that are motion detecting, light detecting. They turn themselves off when, when, they, when you leave, so now you can yell at your kids, but nobody has to yell at you to turn them off now. But less, less uh, visible is the fact that now we, for fluorescent lights, we now have electronic ballasts, which will replace magnetic ballasts, another efficiency gain. Refrigerators, the data, I think, is fairly dramatic. Um, up until 1972, the average energy use per refrigerator was growing year by year, so that a new refrigerator used almost 2,000 kilowatt hours per year um, in the United States. Uh, after that time, once there was the energy crisis and people started paying attention to that, to energy, there was a um, initiatives through the national labs to create better compressors, better insulation, um, and those made refrigerators much more energy efficient. And then there was a group of regulations that kept pushing the system, and so. Now we see about, um, as of 2000, uh, 2001, and I don't have the more recent data here, a refri new refrigerator takes about 425 kilowatt hours per year as opposed to the about 1800. Is it because the refrigerators are getting smaller? No, they're getting bigger over time still. So again, um, Refrigeration, um, it's a very significant change. Uh, if you look at lighting, um, this lighting re revolution has led to very significant changes, reductions in the amount of uh, electricity used per, per aluminum, uh, per unit of light. And depending upon whether you have just a light bulb or street uh, or um, 
street lights or industrial processes or track lighting is anywhere, anywhere from 48% to 87% reduction in, in, in electricity. So that was all pretty deliberate through the introduction of LEDs. In buildings, what we see now, a lot more insulation. Um, people uh, are replacing pool pumps with, instead of fixed speed, speed pool pumps, variable speed, which will reduce the use of, of electricity by about 80 to 90 percent in a typical installation. Energy Star appliances, uh, you have a different labeling system, but you have the equivalent, more efficient. We have labeling of uh, Energy Star uh, of overall new homes. Title 24 is a California standard. So we have a group of things that have new homes and new buildings more energy efficient. In the commercial sector, um, we have uh, many changes. This at Stanford is the new energy system. Looks complicated, but this is an energy efficiency play. Uh, a uh, cogen plant has, was, uh, had aged and came to the end of its useful life. They replaced it with uh, uh, this system, and all these are hot water tanks. All this does is take electricity and heats it up or cools it. And you do it at the middle of the night, use the electricity in the middle of the night when there's the lowest price. And you store in these tanks the hot and cold water. And with the district heating and cooling system for all the Stanford campus. Uh, that heat exchangers in the buildings so that uh, we capture the waste heat as, as uh, air is taken out of, out of the building. So as, um, pay, it will pay for itself on a discounted present value basis in about 10 years. Uh, in our estimate, um, and, and they're buying now the electricity based upon solar, solar generation of electricity. So it's really an energy efficiency play in the commercial sector. Up above you see the, the dashboard that Microsoft uses in its, its, um, in its headquarters. It allows them from headquarters to track the energy energy use in every one of their facilities in their campus um, can do it on a real-time basis on a lot of different time scales and reallocate their resources um, of people when they see one building that gets a little out of whack in comparison to other buildings, they can say, okay, there's where we have a problem. We can diagnose it centrally. We can allocate resources to go and fix, fix those problems. It's, it's, only do, it's done as a profit-maximizing strategy for, for Microsoft. Uh, Empire State Building um, retrofit, and we have some very big buildings retrofit, um, that, again, are very, very profitable on a discounted present value basis. They're estimated the payback of that is uh, about seven or eight years on uh, discounted present value. Uh, interestingly, they find that if you, what was effective is a set of things that were, affects the whole building, that's the pink, and a set of things that all all within the the tenant space, and the things within the tenant spaces needed new contracts that were incentive compatible. So they spend a, a lot of legal attention getting incentive compatible shared savings contracts uh, for the tenant space, and and the biggest energy savings and the um, of the whole thing was in the in the tenant space where they, they had both the physical changes and the set of new contracts that allowed the savings. Um, we have, have the U.S., the Green Building Council, um, lease certified buildings in Silicon Valley. No high-tech company will ever build a building unless it's certified gold or, or platinum. 
And why is that? Well, because it matters in the labor market. Because if, if they're looking to get the bright new graduates coming from Stanford or Berkeley or the other universities, a lot of them care about the environment. They want companies that walk to walk, not just talk to talk. So one way you symbolize is make sure your buildings are LEED certified, LEED uh, is leadership in energy and environmental development. And, and that becomes an important selling, selling uh, pitch for hiring the employees you want. So these are all leading to more energy efficient buildings. Um, cars and trucks, prior to the energy crisis, the, the annual average fuel economy of all vehicles and miles per gallon was declining year after year until we had the oil crisis, higher prices and fuel efficiency standards. So the average car on the road got 12 and a half miles per gallon. Now it's roughly doubled in, in that time. Um, you can see some of the physical changes just by looking at 1973 Chevy Impala versus 2014 Chevy Impala, basically the same scale. The passenger compartment is the same size, no loss. The front end and the back end are different. They're different, and uh, one is massive, the other is compact, but Notice the green Impala, the front surface, that will give you turbulent airflow. This will give you laminar airflow. So the aerodynamics are very different uh, in the cars. So the, so the cars now are faster than they were at that time. Um, not more expensive when you adjust for inflation, um, but much more fuel efficiency. Air travel. Uh, if you look at the, uh, in the air travel in the United States, um, the domestic and international, two different graphs, from the time of the oil crisis till now, the fuel use per seat mile, now be careful, per seat mile, is down by a factor of two. We use half as much fuel per seat mile, and, and that's basically because we have more efficient engines, we have lighter materials, we have winglets on the airplane, and we move the seats a little closer together. Uh, I don't mean we, because I'm one of the people who just flies in them and notices that they're closer together. That's technology, but the better measure of energy efficiency is fuel per passenger mile, because you don't care if you move the seats around, you care about if you move the people around. That, 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 that is more dramatic. We use a quarter as much fuel per, uh, seat, per passenger mile as we did at the time of the crisis. And the big difference is yield management. Um, Airlines who do stochastic forecasting of their load uh, have the prices which vary as a function of time as you see uh, how full a flight's going to be. And some of you, I don't know how much you do that in New Zealand, the, in the U.S. I'll check on the price of a flight, talk with my wife, we try to decide whether we're going to do it. I go back three days later. And it's and it's thirty percent more expensive, or twenty percent less expensive. Um, it's it's all part of a system of getting uh, managing the capacity factor of airlines to keep them as full as possible all the time, and that's been very fundamental. That and and the. Uh, optimization of routings, very significant optimization programs have, have led to uh, very full airplanes, a lot more profit for the airlines, and a lot less use of energy in the United States. I, I mentioned the buildings. Uh, um, so with these changes, quantitatively, did they matter? And first, I, if you think about all the examples, you say, 
every one of these is small. You know, it's, it's a building here. It's a, it's, it's, it's a campus. Well, if you look at now the aggregate statistics, going up to 1975, 1973, in the industrial, transportation, residential, and commercial sectors, every sector was growing right along with the economy, a little bit less rapidly than the economy, but growing pretty well with the U.S. economy until the oil crisis. And if you look at the, if you follow the, the trends in the industrial sector, they broke. It flattened out. Uh, so we're using about as much energy right now in the industrial sector of the U.S. economy as we did in 1973. Um, the transportation sector turned down because of the more fuel-efficient vehicles and the, the yield management in airlines. Uh, residential sector, the better insulation of buildings, the more efficient, uh, uh, efficient appliances, that turned down, and commercial sector turned down, turned down less. So you can see in these aggregate statistics a big change. So one of the first questions is, well, that industrial sector, you can't count that because the industrial sector collapsed in the United States, or that's the answer that I get. Well, actually, it's not true because this black shows the uh, index of industrial production in the U.S. just continued to go up in, until uh, about 19, uh, 2007, and that became with the competition with China, it reduced it, but, but the use of energy <coughs> did flatten out. So you may say, well, it's, you produce more things, but you produce different things, and that's true. If you were to decompose this into structural shifts where the manufacturers chose to manufacture different things that are energy intensive, which are less energy intensive, that's a structural shift. They did it for profit incentives. This was, this was, this was not to help the environment, this was to help the bottom line. Um, you break it down to those structural shifts versus the shifts in how much energy it used to do the same thing or do the same type of industry. It's about half and half. That shift was about half structural changes, about, about half, um, half energy efficient uh, changes in energy efficiency. So if you look at, at the aggregate statistics, uh, if you look at the energy intensity of the U.S. economy, and I measure that as uh, 1,000 BTUs, British thermal units, uh, uh, per 2000, $2,009 of U.S. GDP. So if you look at first before the energy crisis, that measure of energy intensity was re being reduced by, by, about, um, by about half of a percent a year. And that had been going on for about 25 or 30 years before that time period. A little bit of fluctuations up and down, but about averaging about half a percent a year, less rapid growth in the economy. <coughs> the shot across the bow with the oil, with the, uh, oil crisis and higher prices, we had a lot of policy initiatives, a lot of attention paid, and in this time period, we had, uh, until the oil prices collapsed, a reduction of 2.7% a year in that energy intensity. Oil prices collapsed in 1985, and we, we reduced our policy attention so that uh, initially we had about a 1.7% a year decline, going from 2.7 to 1.7. And then more recently, where we had very high prices and still very little policy, it was still about 1.7% per year decline. So it looks like from this, it suggests that the configuration of everything together, the policies, may have made more of an effect in the short run than just the price variations taken alone. 
Now, for me, 2.7% or 1.7% a year seems like a small number. It's very, uh, um, how many people are parents here? How many people noticed that the kids weren't growing very much week by week by week until one day they came and asked for college tuition and he said, wow, they grew. Well, same thing happened here. Um, in 1973, uh, we used 14,000 BTUs per dollar of GDP. By 2014, that that 2.7% or 1.7% reduced to 6,000 BTUs per year. Small changes over a long period of time can accumulate to a massive change, and that's what's happened in the U.S. economy. So uh, let's look at the effect on energy security. If we, this plotted from 1950 to 2000, 2014. The red line is what the energy use would have been if there was no, none of those changes in trends from the past. Uh, we would be up to about 180 quads or quadrillion BTUs. Uh, the blue line is what actually happened as a result of all of these curves that I showed in bending down. So that in the U.S. we have a lot of advertisement coming from our friends at the American Petroleum Institute that says, we found the new energy power in the world. It's the United States. Because of the fracking for natural gas and the additional production of oil, we will soon become a net exporter of energy in the United States. That's mostly right except for the reasoning. Uh, <laughs> So if you say, well, why we have less energy imports? Um, if you consume less, you import less. So this reduction is about 80 quads reduction, quadrillion BTUs, because of what's happened on the demand side. And this yellow, which is net energy imports, notice it's back to where it was in 1973 and getting smaller so we will become a net exporter. 80 quads of that reduction is basically what happened on the demand side of energy markets, the turn down of all of those curves. On the supply side, 22 quads uh, of additional domestic supply reduced imports. Notice that purple, that's nuclear power, which is something you don't have and have as a deliberate policy choice here in New Zealand. Uh, that's, a, that's about about eight quads of it. The green is increased um, renewable, but that's almost all hydropower and just combustion of wood. So the black the increase from there to there of about eight quads is the result of oil and gas and fracking and everything that's happened in the oil and gas industry. So it is true. That's eight quads of reduction of imports due to oil and gas production. Eighty quads based upon energy efficiency. So again, if you link energy security to the massive oil imports, and other energy imports, energy efficiency has fundamentally changed the energy security of the United States. Um, it, now, am I saying that we would have in fact imported the yellow plus the gray if, if we didn't have the energy efficiency? No, the world market wouldn't have supported that. We were putting so much pressure on the world and oil market that we wouldn't have, have $50 oil. We'd have, I don't know, $300 oil. My friends at Todd may have been happy with that, but consumers of energy would not have been happy, ha happy with that. And markets would have adjusted, and you would have been forced to get energy efficiency if you, were, if you weren't having it um, as a result. So that's my contention that 
not just at the little scale, but in the big scale, energy efficiency has been fundamental to energy security. Let's look at carbon dioxide emissions. This is my one equation of the talk. Um, I want to look at carbon dioxide emissions per dollar of GDP, the carbon intensity of the economy, and analyze why we ha now have such, a, in the U.S., have so much less energy intensive economy. So you can decompose this uh, carbon dioxide emissions per GDP by two products multiplied together. It's just purely identity. It's carbon dioxide per unit of energy multiplied by energy use per unit of GDP. So it's purely identity, but, but this is the demand side of energy markets, and that's the supply side, the, the carbon intensity of the energy system, of, of uh, I, I'll say, the ener of energy consumption, uh, as opposed to energy production, because if you import energy, I count that as energy consumption in terms of the, the carbon dioxide intensity. So in the U.S., the energy intensity, uh, the carbon intensity of the U.S. economy, I scaled at 1 in 1973, it's down to 0.39, so we've decarbonized the U.S. economy by 61% since the crisis. That is, uh, um, we have now ha released about 39% as much carbon dioxide per dollar of GDP. Um, but what I find interesting is why. The first component of that is the trends that we had before the energy crisis. If those trends continued, the half a percent a year during that time, we'd get that blue amount. Uh, the turned out on all of those curves, the, the real change of the energy efficiency uh, initiatives since that time leads to the green, is the green incentive. Uh, curve. So the green plus the blue is the change in energy intensity of, of the U.S. economy. Uh, and so you say, well, where there's room for cleaning up of the energy system? Well, the thickness of that black line is the decarbonization of the energy s system in the United States. Uh, this decarbonization is the result of wind and solar, and geothermal, and fracking for natural gas, and nuclear power all put together. 60% um, of that is nuclear power. So, uh, and wind and solar is about that much. So you hear a lot about wind and solar as the fastest growing form of energy in the United States. It is in percentage terms. When you start from zero and you get to zero plus, it's a high percentage rate of growth. But said, yes, we decarbonize the U.S. energy economy. But it's almost all on the demand side of the market. Almost only an insignificant component is wind plus solar plus geothermal and fracking for natural gas. Those are all good things to do, but they aren't what de uh, decarbonize the economy. Okay, so I've been talking all about U.S. to a New Zealand audience. So maybe some of the Kiwis would like to see how these changes compare with, with New Zealand. First, to do an international context of, of some of the big countries in the world, uh, China, Germany, UK, France, India, US, Japan, and New Zealand. Uh, first, you see China, this is carbon dioxide intensity trends. China's been off the map, but going down rather quickly, but still much more intense because of, they become the manufacturing center for the world, for the heavy manufacturing. New Zealand here, it, it was increasing the carbon intensity of your economy 
was increasing until uh, about 1991. Once you, till, till roughly, shortly after the time where you restructure the economy and move much more towards a market, market-oriented market economy, uh, governed more by competition, and since that time, the energy, the carbon intensity of your economy has been declining. So you're right now about in the middle of the pack uh, of uh, UK, Germany, uh, India, US, Japan. Some lower, some some higher than than you. Um, That's energy intensity, but again, you could ask why. Oh, excuse me, that's carbon intensity uh, of your economy. You could ask why. Well, you could ask, first you start with that first term, energy intensity. Energy intensity was down among the pack, but just kept rising until you, you restructured your economy. And then it's declining, but your energy intensity is higher than everybody else of these major countries except for China. China is more energy intense than you, but I never think of, of New Zealand as the center of heavy manufacturing in the world, uh, unless you think of uh, cows and sheep as heavy. Uh, but. Uh, so you, you've had a mixed story on energy efficiency here. While you lower the carbon dioxide, you, you have a less carbon intense energy system than all of these other countries except France. France is, uh, most, most of these, we can think of them as in two groups, China and India, very carbon intensive uh, industrial and manufacturing processes. Group of other countries uh, in the middle, New Zealand, uh, much less carbon intense energy system. And France is really the outlier because they have focused their electricity system uh, on nuclear power. They generate most of it with nuclear and, and that's what's, what's differentiated them. Uh, so, so your relatively low carbon dioxide intensity of your economy or be it, uh, in the middle of, this, of the other countries is a result of energy efficient, not so much. You want a very energy efficient economy. And, but your production on the average is pretty clean. Getting dirtier, but over time, but relatively clean. Uh, so one of the things to explain, and this most of you probably know, so I'll be very quickly, is the mix of energy, energy supplies. If you look at US, um, the biggest supplies of energy are petroleum, natural gas, coal, the nuclear, hydroelectric is really small, biomass is small, geothermal is small, wind and solar are pretty small. Um, U.S. energy use is then dominated by the fossil fuels, petroleum, natural gas, and coal. Uh, the world eh, doesn't look that much different other than it's bigger, uses more coal as a fraction of, of the energy. Um, but look somewhat the same. New Zealand is different. New Zealand is different. You're blessed with a lot of hydropower. And because you have so much of your energy system is hydropower, you have a clean energy system. Um, now, that's one of the great advantages of having a small population in a big na in a geographically big nation with with significant hydropower resources that are de can be developed. Um, this downward trend in hydropower, I think is just the f last, the four years that I have the data. Um, somebody can tell me if it's anything different than, than rainfall changes from year to year. Um, 
you relatively high geothermal of course you have no nuclear power and so the the reality of hydro is what has given you very low carbon intensity of your energy but that's one side of the equation if you look forward I, again I can be corrected but I don't anticipate a large ability to expand the amount of hydropower that's coming. As your economy continues to grow, as it does, and continues to use more energy, hydropower is not apt to grow and it's going to have to come out of something else. And I suspect that it's either at the margin uh, the marginal use of energy is coming from these fossil fuels so that the natural advantage you have is likely to disappear over time um, but you know you guys can you know more about New Zealand than I do so that may be wrong so if if we go back to those factors remember US I said these are the factors uh, you can draw a similar diagram for New, New Zealand only notice this the highest scale is one in New Zealand you say okay here's been the pattern of carbon intensity of the economy I don't have data that goes back to 1973 some of you may and some of you may want to do some of this going back a longer period of time and if you do please send me the results uh, but we the uh, uh, economy got more and more carbon intense until about 1991 and then it's declined so you're now about 10 percent less carbon intense than you were in 1980 so in the 35 years you reduce the carbon intensity on average of about 10 percent but again it's useful to look at why energy efficiency is the green um, if if you look at the energy efficiency you you're about 18 percent less energy intense than you were in 19 in 1980 so there's been gain on energy efficiency compensated by losses on the supply system and the supply system is getting more carbon intense that is more carbon released per per petajoule of energy than than you have so the net is a is a red line so the that gray is the contribution towards recarbonizing your economy due to changes in the supply side so quite different from the United States um, when should I start? I want to give another five minutes. Okay. So how did this happen? I can't do this in five minutes anyway. I, I didn't see your fingers. So, so what changed? Well, first we had the oil prices and the second, coming later, we had the, the changes in the um, uh, recognition of the global climate change issues. Those first came in 1979 with the National Academy of Sciences first warning, 1990 the first IPCC assessment, after that the Rio Convention. So in the U.S. we've had those two forces that have led to what, what I have this chain of uh, uh, causation. Starting with the energy prices going up, you had first a really strong belief that energy security was a nation, national problem that we had to deal with. We saw the actual consequences of the disruptions in the oil market. At the same time, there was an increased oil prices and the expectation that oil prices are going to stay high over time. Coming at a later time was the, was the um, environmental notions of, of global climate change um, 
and, and the national objective held by about 80% of the population and 40% of the members of the legislature that glo global climate change is, is worth taking care of. So those were objectives. They created a group of in instruments. Um, instruments that were motivated first by the oil objectives. We put an energy efficiency standards on automobiles. We had appliance efficiency standards. We had standards on buildings. We had uh, those heavy hand the government. But then we had labeling, a uh, group of nudges, subsidies, uh, attitude changes um, that changed expectations of people as to what the right thing to do was. And those changed belief structures were again driven by the same policy concern. And then finally the government started spending a lot of money in research and development which in private, private sector, public sector partnerships created a lot of technologies that were more energy efficient. Once we got the global climate change concerns, that reinforced each one of those uh, initiatives that, that were, came in afterwards. So, but amplifying this was a group of non-governmental organizations who played very powerful roles in both legislatively and working with corporations to help them find ways of more, uh, uh, more energy efficiency that would be both profitable. So things like national uh, NRDC, national, Na Natural Resources Defense Council, worked with many corporations to show them ways that they could be a lot cleaner and more profitable simultaneously. So it led to the outcomes, more efficient buildings, efficient practices and technology and corporations. Um, there were also the economic motivations which reinforce these. So what we had in the US is a whole system of things working together where in many ways the whole was greater than the sum of the parts. The economic incentives, the regulatory incentives, the NGOs, the change in attitudes was a system working together that led to this uh, very dramatic changes in the energy efficiency in the economy. So if I ask who and what, corporations, companies, governments, NGOs, utilities operating there, research organizations, individuals, each was doing some part in this overall system. And if you look around the people in the room, it's people and organizations just as you see here in the room that collectively were working on different parts of it. Uh, I want to illustrate, I mentioned it organizations promoting energy efficiency. This is an incomplete list of the more significant uh, organizations in the U.S. that are just actively operating for energy efficiency. There's a federal government, state government, but this is just a list of, of uh, some of the more significant non-governmental organizations in the U.S which in part of a democratic process, you have groups like that evolving and, and, and becoming significant. But we had federal equipment efficiency standards. This is a list of just the ones in the residential sector. And notice those at the federal level. And notice there's a group of individual states that on top of it have their own efficiency standards that are more intense than, than the... Uh, federal government. Many corp U.S. corporations have set up internal carbon pricing, like uh, Microsoft, for example, has about a $6 a ton internal carbon price that they apply to all of their operations internally. They apply to their server firms. They, they apply to their purchasing strategies. And it becomes transfers not outside to a government agency, but, but within, that, that are directly charged to the various divisions and activities in Microsoft, which motivates a continuing uh, movement. Uh, ExxonMobil 
uses a much higher carbon tax. They don't apply it to their operations in general, but they apply it to their investment decisions when they're looking for new resources that they use a much higher carbon tax. So you ask, why would they do this? Because they anticipate that, that most of these are international corporations. They anticipate that around the world there's going to be either carbon taxes or other carbon restrictions or cap and trade systems. And they've, they've decided that if they move gradually into it by having the system internally, they don't disrupt their operations as well as much as if they did nothing and things happened around them. So we have those internal carbon prices. We have the uh, uh, various labeling or nudges. Um, uh, we're, we're now in automobiles and refrigerators and appliances. You see the energy use rather than just uh, the cost of energy use. Uh, there, there is a strategy sort of philosophically used by a uh, set of the U.S. government agencies and illustrated by this picture. If you look at sort of a, a, a number of units sold of, of a given type of appliance, and this way it would be more energy efficient. It's sort of a bell curve. Uh, many of the government agencies focus on R&D, which is trying to increase the right-hand side, move it to some more efficient products. They have building codes and standards which cuts off the bottom, pushes the bottom up there. The energy star, these labeling and nudges, tends to move everything on the right. And the idea is, is the combination of all of them together gives a market transformation. And you've seen that example in the refrigerators. That data is a, a really good example where each one of these elements were, were coming in place. So let me try to quickly just go. If you were thinking about this in the United States or New Zealand, what are some of the policies that you'd use? And first, I want to point out no silver bullets. Just the, the big change we've seen in the U.S. has been a lot of little things accumulated. That's what I anticipate in the future. For those of you who've been hunting, you know what I mean, saying no silver bullets, no silver buckshot, maybe a lot of silver birdshot that all collectively makes a difference. Uh, informing. This is just empowering consumers to make the, the choices that are good for them. Labeling, uh, commercial building performance rating and disclosure allows the new tenant in the building to know what they're getting. Really very market oriented. Smart metering and feedback allows you to see your energy use and see how your electricity use changes with your action. Building information management systems. So information has been a very, is a very powerful thing. Um, education, just a couple of things at Stanford. Uh, we've, we've worked with a group of Girl Scout troops where we educate the Girl Scouts about energy issues. And then they choose things that they can do, some that they can do alone, like cl clean their clothes and hang it on the line, some that they have to do with their parents, like buy light, uh, LED light bulbs and replace incandescent light bulbs. And what we find out is the girls' attitudes change, but the parents' behavior changes. So it's interesting if going through the children has, has changed the behavior of the parents. Uh, online games. Gamification has been an important thing in corporate decision making. Uh, energy efficiency games with testing makes a difference for those you can keep doing it. Uh, energy efficiency calculators we've developed that allows people a better information. So education matters. These nudges. In the US we have a company called Opower that uh, has uh, inserts in, in your electricity bill. And if you use less, and it compares you with the neighbors, not by name, but by average. And 
if you use less than the neighbors significantly, you get a smiley face on the bill. If you use more, you get a frowny face. No financial incentives. You don't even have to read your bill. You don't even have to notice if it's a smiley face or a frowny face. You can turn it upside down if you don't like uh, frowny versus smile. That's worth about 2% a reduction in energy use. Uh, corporations in the U.S. have moved mostly from a point of having energy as an overhead item to uh, energy use reporting within the corporation with the notion of what you measure you start managing. Um, public interest television, uh, Energy Star labeling not only says something about energy use but it becomes an implicit endorsement. Um, financial incentives, higher prices lead to less use of energy. Um, but there's a question of our carbon taxes, controversial here and, and, and in your, your neighbor to the west, uh, whatever, Australia, something like that. Uh, and um, you think of carbon tax, what does a carbon tax do? Well, it, it changes the energy prices and changes these pathways toward changing behavior, but doesn't change the other pathways. And so begs the, my thesis is it was a combination of pathways. So while I, in the U.S., advocate a carbon tax, if you try to take a carbon tax alone and believe it's going to fix the problem, you're probably mistaken because it only works on one of the pathways where it's been the combination of pathways. Regulations, I tend to like regulations only when most users lack full information and would make similar choices. For example, in my house, I want somebody to decide the thickness of the wires to make sure my house doesn't burn down. I don't want to make that decision myself. Everybody, if they had the knowledge, would make the same uh, decision. Uh, the passive chargers in your equipment, I don't know, almost never nobody decides what cell phone to buy based upon whether the charger is efficient or inefficient. They, they don't know. Uh, regulations can push that towards a, a cost minimizing, lifetime cost minimizing. Uh, you, you have um, goods and bads though of regulations. Uh, competitions have been significant. Uh, um, some of those refrigerator changes were based upon a competition among the manufacturers with, with a promised uh, uh, support within the states to build up the market share within the state of California, um, endorsing those. Um, random rewards, I want to sort of end with these because these I find counterintuitive in some way. I, as an economist, think about rational decision-making. And here's an example of using irrationality is very powerful. It, it, and this is the idea that random rewards are much more powerful than deterministic rewards of the same expected value, the same cost. The first ex experiment, um, one of our faculty members, uh, Balaji Pravakar, worked with Infosys in Bangalore. Um, Bangalore. There the traffic is always really bad and it's much worse at rush hour. And so Infosys wanted people to, their employees to come in half an hour or an hour before rush hour because they'd be more productive during the day. So they set up a random reward working with Balaji. Everybody when they came in the bus would put in the bus coupon and uh, at the end of the month, there would be a drawing. If you, if you put in your bus coupon, you came in a half an hour early, you get one chance. An hour earlier, you get two chances, and that would accumulate over the month. One person at the end of the month was drawing would get one month's extra salary. Sounds powerful. Except there's a lot of people that work at Infosys. And the expected value, that is probability times reward, was 20 rupee, 40 cents. 
50 New Zealand cents. Uh, if you ask a high-tech employee to come in for 20 rupees half an hour early, they'd ignore you. Roughly 15% of their employees changed their behavior, time shifted, and the number was growing through the whole length of the experiment. Um, so after the experiment was over, Infosys regrouped, changed the parameters a little and continued as a more permanent program. So he said, well, that's India. I mean, come on, India. You never know that. How about the United States? So they set up this on the Stanford campus. Now, no Stanford faculty members or staff members, uh, students who were eligible, would do this for a small reward. So the reward was, there was a peak time of commuting. If you avoided the peak time and came in the hour afterwards or the hour before, you would get a chance to win. And this was a much smaller amount. If you, if you won, the reward was randomly distributed between $1 and $100. The expected value, again, probability times the reward, is 10 cents. Now, no Stanford faculty member or student would come in for that. But this was a random reward with that same expected value. So if you look at the time pattern of, of commuters in the Stanford, and this was by, measured with RFID tags in people's cars, it was peaking at the rush hour and then going down afterwards. For those people who participated in that had RFID tags, it peaked just before the rush hour, dipped during the rush hour, peaked afterwards. So Stanford faculty and staff, for a 10 cents of expected value, we changed their computing, uh, their, their uh, commuting behavior. So you say, well, why was that? Is it because of the random rewards? We can't sort that out. Whether it's random rewards or that the fact that you knew that you can get rewarded possibly for, for changing your time gave you a sense of this is the right thing to do. I know myself, I got one of those tags, and I would never, I knew what the expected value is. I can do the absolute rational calculations. So I said, I'll never change based on that. But what I found myself is I was about to go home, look at my watch, say so this before or after rush hour. Now, it wasn't that I deliberately changed. It's if it was close to near the end, I'd find an excuse to do something different. You know, there's always another email that you can check on or another, another way you can waste time in your office to, to be outside of it. And I tried to analyze my own behavior, as hard as that is. And I think more than everything, it reminded me that there was a purpose Stanford had for trying to get us to move outside rush hour. There was, there was some county, county uh, regulations under the general use plan. So, so I'd like to believe it was a financial incentive didn't matter because I won a couple of times and I never actually paid attention to how much money I got out of it. It just went into my own checking account. But the fact is that that random reward made a difference. So now the, the follow-up is uh, in the Singapore... Uh, public transit system, they're developing a similar sort of, sort of a frequent rider program with random rewards for, for, uh, for using it an off-peak hour. So again, small expected value, but something that looks significant to people, and so the Singapore system is being designed to take that into account. So what we find is we haven't found all the ways to use random rewards for motivating energy efficient behavior. But what we do find is if you want to change behavior, random rewards are much more powerful than det deterministic rewards of the same expected value. So that's the NSYNC program in Singapore. So in summary, for those nations who want to 
the focus on energy efficiency, and you know, you, you Kiwis can decide whether you want it, what you want to do yourself. But what we found is that there's economic benefits, environmental benefits, and for us, security benefits. Um, there's a bunch of different things that you can end up doing. And if you choose to, but the one message I left is from studying what happened in the U.S., the whole seemed to be much more significant than the sum of the parts. If you try to look at each individual thing, the attitude changes along with the price changes made it easier for people to follow the regulations instead of resisting them. So a system is more powerful than just the elements of the system if you choose to do something. So the last thing is uh, you, I handed out cards to the book. This is my shameful commerce part of it, but the reason it's not that shameful is I don't get any royalties. Hoover Institution has a policy of uh, they want to get the ideas out as broadly as possible so they don't pay any royalties and they have low prices. So, But that card will give you a 30% discount on either the hard 